Welcome to the 700 Club. I'm Pat Robertson, back from a little... Welcome back. <laughs> Boy, <are laughs> Thank you very much. Superman comes back from um, <laughs> after one week. One after week. You were, a week ago today, you were being uh, operated on. I had a laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. I removed my <laughs> prostate. The cancer had spread right to the edges of the prostate. Wow. We got it all out. No cancer. Uh, the doctor said, heart. well, I'll have to check you each year for the next 30 years to see how you do it. <laughs> but I tell you, it's, it's a miracle. And we're going to introduce the, the uh, uh, doctor who performed the surgery. To think that, I mean, three days after the surgery, I walked a mile and I mean, I'm here. I mean, it's, it's, it's Why gone. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> so what else is And how many pounds did you lift, Pat? <laughs> well, that's no the lifting one. allowed. There's no. no lifting. They won't let me lift. But it's amazing, ladies and gentlemen. And we're going to tell you about this prostate cancer. And a lot of you ought to be watching for it, but God did a miracle. And I just can't thank you all for the prayers I've heard from so many people, such wonderful responses, some beautiful cards, and prayers all over. And uh, it's one of those things, and I was, this morning, somebody sent me some roses, and it was early this morning as I was praying, and I just am thankful to be alive. Mm -hmm. You really thank God. Yeah. Uh, Worth thanking Him, too. But uh, I got that little nasty capsule full of cancer out of me. Yeah. And you get on it, and, and I, I didn't, you can't play around with it. That's right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, statistics show that one in five men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. And today we'll tell you how to prevent and to treat this disease. Uh, plus you'll hear about the radical new surgery that promises faster recovery and fewer side effects. As a matter of fact, I'm going to talk with a surgeon who did mine, who pioneered this first technique, the first one of these uh, laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. That's the te technical name, and he'll tell you about it. And again, let's go back to the man who just had uh, the procedure that Galen detailed in his report. Pat Robertson, and Pat, I again welcome you back to the program, and I know you appreciate the need for regular prostate screening, don't you? Well, I've been having prostate screening with PSAs for at least four or five years, and when mine hit, I went from 3.8 to 5.2, we, we called up for one of those biopsies. I had the biopsy pr prior to Christmas, the day after Christmas, I got the word that I had prostate cancer. And when somebody's faced with that situation, you know, there are all kinds of things. I mean, maybe you get a blood clot during surgery. Uh, maybe you, you can get radiation. Maybe you just wait and, and there's a possibility it'll spread and you'll die. You know, it, and, and so if you have surgery, are you gonna be impotent or incontinent or some terrible thing? I mean, there are all these things that come up in your mind, plus they they say it's a four to six week uh, uh, procedure. Well, I think miraculously, just a couple of days before my scheduled surgery on the traditional course, I discovered a wonderful Israeli born urologist who is an expert in what is called laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. He, he works in uh, Miami or the suburb of Miami. Dr. Arnon Krongrad. Dr. Krongrad is an internationally recognized authority on prostate cancer, and he and his clinic have spearheaded the U.S. minimally invasive surgical technique for treating prostate cancer that I just mentioned. And Dr. Krongrad, needless to say, I feel you're God's blessing to me, and I'm here on this show one week. You were cutting me, I mean, not cutting me, but working on me at this very time one week ago. I'm delighted to see you. Hi, Pat. It's good to hear you. I'm glad you're back. Well, you did a tremendous job. You spent 10 years doing the normal prostate surgery when, when you were at Mount Sinai. Well, what did you learn with that uh, invasive procedure? What did I learn with the open operation? Yeah, the open operation. Yeah, well, with the open operation as well as many of the ancillary techniques that we've used over the years, what you learn to appreciate is the complexity of the region in which the prostate resides. You've got the pubic bone, which provides you with a rigid structure and a tiny little cage, essentially, in which to work. Uh, the other organs, such as the rectum, the bladder, the ureters, the veins, need I go on, there are many other things down there. And you learn to appreciate that complexity. Because the open radical prostatectomy, historically, has been a relatively morbid operation, bloody and painful, one of our holy grails has been to try to find some way to remove the prostate, to excise the cancer, while leaving the patient intact. The laparoscopic radical prostatectomy in concept has been very attractive for many years, but of course the technical challenge has been, how does one overcome the complexity that I described uh, in brief now, while achieving the goal of leaving the patient less bloodied and in less pain? 
It took a while. The LRP was actually described in 1991. It, was, it underwent a period of dormancy until it was resurrected in Paris in the late 1990s, which is when I became involved with that project. Today, of course, the LRP is a, is a modern, reproducible technique. It relies on lots of fancy technology, optics, uh, and other things, robotics. Uh, but the reality is that the LRP has achieved at least one of our goals and, and embodies, in essence, the spirit of the first rule of medicine, which is to first do no harm. So what we learned over the years is prostate cancer surgery can be very complicated. It takes a lot of practice. There are challenges. But given the work that's gone into the program, and, and especially the pioneering work of doctors Valenciennes and Guillaume in Paris, the technique that you have described and that you yourself personally have experienced is here and available. You, you did the first one in 1999. How many, how many of these surgeries have you done since? Uh, approximately 200 at this point, with the program growing, of course, as the awareness spreads. I mean, in the beginning, in, in the dark days, if you will, of 1999 and 2000, um, the cases didn't come along so often. Of course, people didn't know about it, uh, and there was a lot of skepticism and a lot of ignorance about what we were actually doing. One should realize that the laparoscopic radical prostatectomy, in principle, is not a new operation. It is the same operation we've done for decades, namely, it excises complete as one whole specimen the prostate and the seminal vesicles. Well, now, of course, it, as I said, the awareness has grown and the frequency has grown, so that patients are coming in from all over and, and the surgical volume well, is growing. You know, you, you've got these little pinpricks and little tiny holes in somebody's stomach. And, and I understand you put the prostate in a bag, seal it up, and then get it out. How do you, how do you get it out of the person's anatomy? You know, it, it, it's funny, but I mean, a lot of patients will ask me that question. How do you get it out as if we wave a magic wand? But I, I turn that around on them and I ask them a simple question, which is, do you have any children? And they kind of look at me funny and say, yeah, we've had a few children. And I ask them, well, how did you get them out? <laughs> the simple reality, of course, is that uh, tissues are compressible. The prostate uh, is compressible. Uh, the abdominal cavity and the abdominal wall are elastic. And one hole fits inside the other. That's really an easy part of the operation. Well, I know in my case, I was up walking that evening, released in the hospital the next day, and walked a mile about three days later, and here I am. And, and uh, you got all, of, all the cancer, didn't you? It was all gone? Well, that's right, Pat. Yes, I believe that. And in fact, I, I will add that you gave me kind of a fright the next day because uh, you may not have been aware of it, but you had surgery on a Monday. Uh, Tuesday, I tried to find you at your hotel. Of course, of course you had checked out Tuesday morning, and I couldn't. But that's only because you were down by the pool, uh, sitting in the sun, thinking about what had happened. <laughs> well, I've had nothing but good thoughts since. But uh, uh, is, is this spreading? I mean, is this something uh, that can be re uh, replicated? You can train people to do this. It, it does take a good deal of skill. You, you, use a, you use a robot, I understand, to hold the camera, a, a robot that is voice activated. Yes. I mean, the program that we developed at North Shore does, in fact, uh, involve robotic assistance. The particular robot that we use is called an ESOP, uh, made by a company called Computer Motion out in California. There are different robots available, including different models that Computer Motion makes. Uh, but again, the one uh, that we used over at North Shore is, is a, like a one-armed bandit, but it's, it's, it's voice controlled. It acts like a shoulder, elbow, and wrist that I use to help me maneuver uh, the camera inside the body. Oh. Yeah, but, but the surgery itself, the way we're doing it now, um, is done by me. I hold the instruments that do the cutting and the reconstruction. Uh, I've heard, was told as a matter of fact, that uh, up to four on a PSA is normal. Uh, and what do you say about this? That, that's a little extreme statement, isn't it? Yes, that concept, up to four is normal, is a very dangerous concept because the word normal has very important connotations for people and specifically what the word normal connotes is there is no risk. The reason that's a dangerous concept is because we have very good data, very reproducible data, that the risk of having a positive biopsy when the PSA is between two and a half and four, for example, is approximately 25 percent, which is exactly what it is between four and ten. And so while historically the labs have adopted a certain standard that they report um, when, they, when they give you the PSA, that up to four is normal, the data are consistent that there is risk when the PSA is below four. You know, the LRP has helped us address one of the objectives that we've had in clinical medicine, and that is to reduce the pain and suffering of the treatment, a very important, 
very important clinical objective. It does not solve all of our problems with prostate cancer and, and obviously it doesn't begin to address some of the issues, including the one that you raised, related to diagnosis. Let, let me ask you one last question. What do you tell somebody? I mean, at uh, uh, 40, 45, 50, what, what should men do? It's a, it's a difficult question to answer because a lot of factors uh, weigh into it. Look, I, I routinely take care of, of men in their 40s who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer, including sometimes aggressive prostate cancer, but also men really at the very early stages. I recently operated on a 39-year-old with prostate cancer. And so there is no absolute uh, safe zone. Um, what one has to take into account is the baseline PSA, the trends in PSA over time, family history, and physical examinations. Obviously, somebody who's got a father and an uncle and a grandfather or a brother with prostate cancer is at much higher risk than somebody who doesn't have those affected members in his family. So really, a lot of factors weigh into these recommendations. Well, you know, I was all set to have that bloody operation. I'd already given uh, uh, two units of blood to, to t have transfusions, and I was looking at a four to six week recovery, and here I am one week later. Uh, and uh, in, in my, my humble opinion, you were God's gift to me, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, I, l l let me ask you, how does somebody get in touch with you if they, if they want further information? Well, uh, we run an office uh, in Aventura, Florida. But for patients who, who want just the nitty-gritty, the details, you know, one of the problems with LRP as of today is that it's very hard to find information about it. Uh, we've developed a website with everything, including the original technical manual uh, that we published with Valencien and Guillano. Uh, as well as patient stories, patients such as yourself writing about what happened, how they made their decisions, as well as uh, lots of other material related to prostate cancer and laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. That website is www.krongrad-urology.com. Krongrad is K-R-O-N-G-R-A-D. Again, a lot of content uh, answering questions about laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. Doctor, thank you very much for being with us. I know you've helped a lot of men and you certainly helped me. You're welcome, Pat. And ladies and gentlemen, if you can't remember what he just said, you can link to Dr. Krongrad's website by going to the CBN.com, and we'll link you on to uh, krongradurology.com. So in any event, we're back.